Okay, we're back here live in New York City for the special CUBE, Silicon Angle Wikibon CUBE presentation with HP Moonshot, their big announcement here, changing the game on the data center, uh, disrupting the cloud, mobile, and social, and big data. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and I'm joined by co host I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. Mike Major is here, who's the Vice President of Corporate Communications, uh, and we've got, you, you are the manufacturer of X-Genes at Applied Micro. Yes, we are. <laughs> right, so X-Gene is a, you know, Pretty intriguing name. Um, tell us about um, Applied Micro first. Not a lot of people you know, know who you guys are um, and what you do, and then we'll get into the whole you know, moonshot space. Yeah, well, we're, we're a semiconductor company. We've been around for a long time. The company was founded in 1979. Uh, more recently, our, our really rich legacy is in uh, connectivity products for telecom. Uh, in 2004, we got into embedded processor products, mm -hmm. and then we've been working on this uh, this ARM 64-bit server on chip product now oh, since. Wow. Well, we conceived of it in um, in 2009, and we finally are at silicon. So hold it up for the folks there. We see the prop here. This is. I want to ask a few questions about the board. A little higher. There, you got that. All right, got that, uh, Mick. Got that. Okay, yep. okay, good. So okay. my question is: We're getting a lot of uh, people on the Twitter uh, sphere asking how it's software defined. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how that plays into, obviously the power and cooling, but Dave Donatelli said it's software-defined server. Is that because of the software on the actual uh, blade or cartridge, or is it more enabling software developers? Well, um, I'll leave it to HP to talk about their specific products. I can tell you where, where Xgene is concerned. Uh, we have our, our first generation that is, that is now in silicon. Um, along with our, our eight big 2.4 gigahertz cores on, on that chip. We've got four smaller ARM, processor, ARM processors, and they're there to handle um, uh, both storage and networking offloads. So uh, it would not be that difficult to, to use that capability for... So it's programmable. I exactly. So that's, that's kind of what they mean by that, okay. Um, and just in terms of, can I see the, uh, the cartridge? Sure. What's been the feedback that you've been hearing about some of the, the, uh, the stuff you've been doing with it? Well, the, the interesting thing about uh, where we are, and, and we are really, uh, I think, differentiating ourselves in the, in the ARM world, is that we designed this um, uh, ourselves. We, we got an architecture license from ARM way back when. We were the first one, uh, first architecture license for 64-bit. For and, and the reason that we did that is we wanted to develop a product that would actually um, have the capability of the currently deployed infrastructure. In other words, it, you know, what's out there now is Xeon class, E3 and E5. And, and we, have, we have designed our product specifically to, to compete it in that range with that kind of capability. And you focus on the high performance sector, right? Can, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Because you don't typically associate you know, ARM with high performance, you know, in the broad sc scale, but, but in your little part of the world, you certainly do, right? Right, yeah. and, and I've, you know, been watching the presentations today, they've been terrific, and talking about, you know, s bringing cell phone and, and tablet mm -hmm. technology to servers, we've actually leapt beyond that to, 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 like I say, the currently deployed level of capability. So, um, you know, the, while there is great growth, in, in the cloud, and everybody's really excited about how, how the demand of handheld devices and all is gonna cause the cloud to expand. The cloud already exists. And, and data operators are not going to go take out the, their currently deployed assets and replace them with something different if that other different thing isn't set up to run the currently deployed software. You know, they don't want to go backwards. They're not going to take a step down in terms of capability. So we felt there was a great opportunity for us to, to enter the market with this high-level product that, that really, um, you know, from a data center operator, it's, it's really easy to, to plug and play. So can, can hold this up again, if you would. Tell us what we're looking at here and, and take us through sort of the, the IP on this card. Well, I'll, I'll talk about our chip rather than the card. Yeah. You know, this, this is our X-Gene server on a right, chip. Right. Um, it, uh, it it has eight cores uh, that have been clocked at, at 2.4 gigahertz. It's got four smaller cores for the uh, for the stor storage and networking offloads. Uh, it's got it's got four 10 gig pipes on it, and the idea there was 
uh, not only to facilitate communication be between between nodes, but but it, it, you need that for big data. Right. Uh, it, 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 we were presenting at uh, ARM TechCon last November, and uh, Amr Awadala from uh, uh, from Cloudera was there, and he he very clearly said we are excited about this product coming along. Big data needs 10 gig. Yeah, it needs 10 gig, and, and what about low power? What, what, what's exciting about that from a big data perspective, you know, specifically or generally? Well, we, we've modeled this and at, at, at what we expect are real world cloud workloads. And for our first generation product that you see here, um, we feel that the power savings is going to be on the order of 50%. So we're not talking about the ultra low, you know, lowest, lowest level, but we're talking about uh, giving a very high level of performance. Uh, giving a very high level of reliability, giving all the server class stuff that is out there today, but doing it for a greatly reduced cost. Mike, why did Amar Awadala be excited by it? He's a friend of ours, been on theCUBE multiple times. We love Cloudera, um, uh, scale out open source is something that we, we love to, to promote because it's relevant, but why was he excited um, about this comment, your comment to Amar? Well again, it's, uh, it's for, it's it's for two things. One, one is it's 64-bit, mm -hmm. so the the addressable memory uh, is not constrained to to four gig, and and secondly, with the big pipes, you know, as you're moving large amounts of data in and out, you're doing analytics on that big data. It gets to it much faster. Yeah, so the data pipeline is huge for them. Yeah, because that's Hadoop. They're moving a lot of batch around. Yeah. Um, where do you see this going for you guys in terms of the next generation capabilities, and and what other capabilities do you guys have in this architecture? Well. Uh, with the uh, background that we have in the in the connectivity and the analog mixed signal area, um, we're we're used to having uh, high speed products. We we have um, 100 gig in silicon right now, and so the this the speed capabilities uh, that we're going to see on, on next generation product are, are going to go up. And, you know, at, at Open Compute in January, our CEO mentioned that the, the next step for us is is 100 gig. So that's the you know. Instead of bigger, bigger, faster, better, it's going to be you know everything in this world is now smaller, faster, better. I'm, right? I'm reading. I pulled up the ARM uh, website, ARM processor business model system on a chip. It's obviously it's all the rage. That's where everyone's going. What share with the folks out there things that you've heard that confuse people and what you can do to kind of clear up kind of any kind of misconceptions or clarity around how complicated this is and kind of what is it? What does this mean for computing and software-led infrastructure and applications? Well, I think there I think there are two dimensions. One one is the cloud is going to grow substantially over time. I mean, everybody that yeah. you've talked to today has been. <laughs> it's going to be extra innings. We heard, <laughs> and and as that as that growth occurs, I think what you're going to see are uh, the data center operators plug in very specific tailored uh, configurations for whatever their their workload happens to be. So you know, obviously, doing that uh, is. is is going to reduce operating costs. It's going to reduce power consumption. There's going to be a lot of a lot of goodness that comes from that. Um, but in terms of the more immediate opportunity, you know, I, I, I think we're looking at a, at a more immediate opportunity as well, where the, the, the currently deployed infrastructure can be replaced with uh, with XGene um, and and specifically here on the on the HP cartridge. Um, the um, the lower level software that's uh, that's operating on, on top of the operating system, the applications can be recompiled fairly easily because you're, you're recompiling from 64-bit to 64-bit. And then there's another layer of software that's, that's running on, on Java, and Java has announced developing 64-bit as well. So um, mu much of the application layer in the data centers already runs on Java. It'll be really easy to port that over. So t let's talk about nice that a little bit. Uh, because you're basically putting forth this value proposition to to IT managers that you don't have to rip and replace to take advantage of XGene, and you get the benefits of, you know, you maintain a high performance and you get low power. So um, talk us through, you're saying you, re you recompile 64 to 64, you know, Java's there. So from an application development standpoint, um, what kind of cycle time are we talking to, or elapsed time to actually port applications to XGene? For example. Well, I think I think what you'll find um, in in the hyperscale data centers is it will be easiest for them because mm -hmm. they mostly rely on their own own code anyway, and, um, and and I think they'll they'll be the the first the first movers. There's a second wave we believe of um, of enterprise users, 
and and they're going to I, I think wait and see how this stuff works at the at the hyperscale level. They're going to wait for for uh, fully supported uh, software releases. So I think I think there we're looking a, a little bit longer. But um, uh, you, you know, I, I personally I think I think that this will. Um, deploy in test environments fairly quickly and that I, I think I think our customers will like what they see. Okay, yeah. so you, you, you cited web serving, big data analytics, media streaming is on your website, uh, Hadoop and, and caching. So those will go down first. Right. And then how long do you think it'll take to trickle into, you know, the hyperscale is bleeding into certain parts of the enterprise. How long do you think it'll take to actually start to get, you know, picked up in the traditional enterprise and what apps will go first? Is, is it going to be SAP, ERP, Oracle, or, or some sort of fringe apps? Again, I, I think the enterprise customers tend to be a, a little more conservative by nature, so if uh, you were to ask me how, how I see things unfolding, I, I would guess that it will be more the fringe apps first, and as they as they, as they they bang on it and feel the reliability is there, they'll put more of their core their core. Yeah, but so the world you know, never thought that x86 was going to run you know, database applications, yeah. right? And look at it now, right? Yeah, so yeah. it looks like a water-cooled mainframe when you look, look <laughs> right. at it, right? Um, so uh, a lot of people perfectly expect that, that ARM-based processors, low-power processors are going to, you know, essentially eat into the enterprise. You would agree with that, yes? Yeah. It might take decades, but. Uh, well, I don't think it'll take, it. it'll take years <laughs> rather than there decades. There you go. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we're honing in, Mike. Yeah. On the, uh, <laughs> There's the a little, difference. so we're getting a little Twitter action going on here, and one of the comments that's getting traction is, anything that's measured by rack density and power consumption doesn't qualify as software defined. And that's obviously coming from folks who are trying to compete in that software defined data center world. Um, but, but software defined data center is kind of the destination for a lot of the vendors to kind of get to this cloud operations where you have orchestration in software. Um, what do you think about that market, this whole software defined, and where you have massive scale out and hyperscale as the destination? Some are saying that it's a race to hyperscale architecture, yeah. and whoever, don't, whoever doesn't get there will have to buy someone else's infrastructure, the cloud, et cetera. Um, do you, what's your take on that, that marketplace? Well, let's, let's talk about the, the software def defined aspect of it. I mean, the most uh, uh, immediate and tangible, I think, is, is software defined networking. Yep. And um, and y you know that that exists today, and and you've heard other vendors talk yeah. about ab your, about uh, their their big switch, their switch fabric capabilities yeah. and all this stuff, right? So that that is definitely here. I mean, the the way we look at it is is when you take that that um, that switching capability and bring it on to the same die where you have your processor and other I/O stuff going on. All of a sudden, y you know, it's more than a software-defined network. It's a it's a software-defined server, software-defined data center. So. Um, you know, I, I think it'll, it, it's going that way. I also think that the, uh, you know, one of the things the data center operators want to have is flexibility and malleability with their, with their deployed hardware. So to the extent they can go in at a software level and, and, and reconfigure and repurpose some of this stuff, um, you know, There's value they, there. they definitely want to do that. They yeah. want that. Yeah, that kind of throw away <laughs> <laughs> monolithic data centers. Um, but that's the trend. Software-defined data center, thanks for coming on theCUBE. We really appreciate it. Uh, that's the hot area, obviously software-defined. There's very, a lot of marketing hype going on, but like OpenStack, which was a lot of marketing at first, now has a lot of legs thanks to software-defined networking. Systems on a chip, all this is great stuff, low power. Again, I think this is a great announcement from HP. I think this is going to be uh, something that a lot of people are going to be following very, very quickly, um, and we're going to continue to break out. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, we okay. appreciate it. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>